Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. The webinar that you have just joined is titled The Good, the Bad and the Ugly Perspectives on Bill C-28 and the Proposed Changes to the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. We appreciate you all taking time out of your busy schedules, especially on, I was going to say a nice summer day, but I don't know where you are. It's pretty rainy where I am. <laughs> so we appreciate you joining us today. My name is April Wepler, and I am the engagement coordinator for the Healthy Great Lakes program at the Canadian Environmental Law Association, or CELA. And I mentioned that it's rainy where I am. Um, I make my home in Guelph, just up the hill from the Speed River. And uh, so Guelph is located on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabek peoples, specifically the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the Six Nations of the Grand Watershed. I'll tell you a little bit about CELA for those who might not be familiar with us. Um, CELA is a specialty legal clinic within the Ontario wide network of clinics funded by Legal Aid Ontario. And we work to protect human health and our environment by seeking justice for those harmed by pollution and by working to change policies to prevent those problems in the first place. As a legal aid clinic, our top priority is to represent low income individuals and communities and to speak up for those with less influence and who have received less of a say in decision making. And if you see me looking back and forth a lot and it's dizzying, I apologize. It's just I'm still letting people in from the waiting room. So I'm jumping screens. We are pleased today to be co-hosting our session with Nature Canada. Nature Canada is one of the oldest nature conservation charities in Canada. And for 80 years, Nature Canada has helped protect over 110 million acres of parks and wildlife areas in Canada and countless species. Today, Nature Canada represents a network of over 100,000 members and supporters and more than 800 nature organizations. Nature Canada is engaging in the modernization of SEPA in order to protect the genetic integrity of wild species and ecosystems and to ensure that Indigenous people's rights are respected. And I, I meant to mention um, when I did my own land acknowledgement, please feel free to share uh, a land acknowledgement of your own in the chat box if you would like to. You're also welcome to introduce yourself. Uh, you can let us know who you are, where you are, uh, what organization you're with if you're joining us from an organization today. We will be doing a couple of quick polling questions in a moment to get a sense of uh, who's on the line, but please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. So for today's webinar, uh, we will be hearing the speakers provide their perspective and an overview on the specific issues related to, be silt to, bill, to bill C-28. Um, but of course, we're not going to be able to touch on all of the issues in the bill or all of the issues in SEPA. Um, we just don't have enough time for that this afternoon. And the webinar was also not designed to be a strategic discussion, but instead to provide participants with some initial thoughts and ideas on the very important issue areas that are covered in the bill. And there will be opportunities in the coming weeks to coordinate strategic discussions on Bill C-28, and uh, we will aim to follow up with participants on those efforts. All right, a little bit of Zoom housekeeping. So we are in the meeting platform today, which means you do all have control over your microphones and your videos but I would ask you to keep your cameras off and your mu microphones muted because of the number of people we have on the line. I know everyone's great at doing that now, so I don't anticipate any problems. You're welcome to use the chat box at any time, as I said, to introduce yourself. You can also pose clarifying questions and we may try to answer those as we go through the presentations. And if you have more substantive questions, please share those as well. We're going to save all of those um, to our Q&A at the end of today's session. All right, so at this time, I am going to just briefly touch on our agenda. Anaria, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you very much. So the agenda for today's session is uh, introductions, obviously, and then we have our presenters. So first, we're going to have Lisa Gu from the David Suzuki Foundation, followed by Anne Rashawn Ford with the Nail Salon Workers Project, which is an initiative of the Parkdale Queen West Community Health. Then Joe Castrilli from the Canadian Environmental Law Association and Hugh Benavides, who's advisor to Nature Canada. And I should just mention that we also have on the line Mark Butler from Nature Canada, Faye de Leon from the Canadian Environmental Law Association, and also Anaria Mukaj from CELA as well. So thanks to everyone for their assistance with today's session. So before I pass the microphone on to Lisa, I'm just going to do a couple of quick poll questions so we can have a better sense of who we have with us today. 
So the first poll question that I'm going to share is about your sector. So if you can let us know perhaps what type of organization you are with, if you're affiliated with an organization, that would be great. We have lots of people on the line today, over 80 right now. So I'm gonna give it another five or seven seconds for people to weigh in. And for those who are joining us just now, welcome. We're just going through some introductions and some polls before we get started. All right, so I'm going to share this back so everyone can see. Uh, not surprisingly, more than half of the people on the line are from non-governmental organizations. Then we have some, also some academics or students, some from government, the legal community, no media today, a couple from industry, and then some others. And you're welcome to let us know what that other sector is in the chat box if you'd like to. All right, the next poll we have today is to get a sense of where you are. So pop quiz if you know your watershed, and if not, we have an other category if you're outside of the Great Lakes, or an unsure category if you're not sure what watershed you're in, and that's okay. So we'll just give that a few more seconds. And for those who just joined, we're just going through some introductions and some polls before we get started. All right, looks like most have answered. So let's share this result back. I'm so curious where everyone is from. Maybe you can jot down in the chat box uh, where you're calling in from today because we don't usually get quite so many in the other box. That's interesting. Lots from Lake Ontario watershed, also Lake Huron and Lake Erie, the St. Lawrence River watershed. One person joining us from Lake Superior, welcome. And a few who aren't sure, and that's okay. The last question we're going to ask today, this is just really helpful for our presenters to get a sense of how much you feel you know about the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Thank you to everyone who is introducing themselves in the chat. This is lovely to get a sense of who's on the line. So welcome. All right, we'll give this just a few more seconds. Okay, and we'll share this back. So about 70% of you indicating you're somewhat knowledgeable about the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Some who are still looking to learn a lot about it today, which is great, and a few really knowledgeable, which maybe is our speakers, <laughs> and probably a number of you in the audience as well. All right, so Anaria, you can stop sharing this slide deck now, please. And I will ask Lisa to go ahead and share her slides and turn her camera on and all those good things. Give you a minute to get that set up. And whenever you're ready, you can unmute yourself and get going. Great, well, thank you, April. Just a quick check. Can you see my screen and hear my voice? Looks great and yes, great. we can hear you, yep. <laughs> Um, thanks to Sila and Nature Canada for organizing this webinar and to all of you joining us. My name is Lisa Gu. I'm the National Policy Manager with the David Suzuki Foundation, joining you from Ottawa on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Um, so I am going to kick off this round of presentations um, with an overview of the environmental rights provisions included in Bill C-28. Um, but before I do that, I um, have been asked to just outline, uh, give it like where things are at with this, with this long anticipated bill to modernize the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Sorry, just having a bit of difficulties advancing my slides, but hopefully I've fixed that now. Um, so uh, many of you will already know that this is just the latest step in a very, very long process that I think um, we could say began in 2016 and 17 with the review of SEPA by the House of Commons Environment Committee. Um, they uh, issued a report in 2017 um, making dozens of recommendations for strengthening the act. And the government response actually commit, agreed with many of the recommendations and committed to legislative amendments 
Um, but then we waited uh, five years almost for um, a bill to be tabled and on April 13th, um, we finally hit that milestone. Bill C-28 is the bill, um, is the government bill introducing amendments that address some of the uh, committee's 2017 recommendations. Unfortunately, that's where, that's the beginning and the end of the story. Um, after introduction, um, the bill really stalled in the, uh, in the, at, at the, for the last two months of the parliamentary session. And parliament is now adjourned until September 20th. And of course, um, that date could change if there's a, that could be pushed out later if there's a, an election. Um, the next steps in the parliamentary process before this bill or any bill could become law is, first of all, um, the debate in the House, which happens uh, for at second reading. Um, and actually, because that debate hasn't yet happened, we don't have a good sense of where opposition parties will land on the bill. Um, and then the next stage, which I've circled in yellow there is, uh, would be if, if the parliament votes in favor of the bill at second reading, it would be referred to the House of Commons Environment Committee for consideration. And that's where uh, we would, the committee would call witnesses to present on various perspectives um, and entertain amendments to the bill. Uh, and then a committee, the committee would have to vote again um, and refer the bill back to the main, the, the main House of Commons for the third and final debate and vote in the House. And if successful, then the process would start all over again in the Senate before this bill could finally become law. And we've really focused, I guess, on uh, trying to get the, see this bill through to the committee uh, phase because that's really where um, the details can be discussed and where, um, again, where amendments can be considered. So just to give some perspective, it would not be unusual for the rest of this process to take a year or even more. Um, it's a lengthy bill. Um, and so I guess it's just important for us to recognize that we have a bill introduced, but we do not yet have changes to the law and we probably won't see those changes um, enter into force anyway for at least another year. Now, of course, if there's an election, all of this process gets interrupted. All bills die on the order paper when parliament is dissolved. Um, but the next government could reintroduce the bill uh, with or without changes. Um, there's no nothing tying a future government to the form of this bill. However, um, we are keen to see Bill C-28 proceed with improvements. Um, I say we at the David Suzuki Foundation. Um, because a back to the drawing board scenario after an election would um, necessitate further delays. So there's four main um, aspects of environmental rights that are uh, the four main ways in which the Bill C-28 addresses environmental rights and I'm just going to zoom through those now. Um, the first one is with a general statement in the preamble and this was a uh, um, one of the few unanimous recommendations in the House of Commons committee report that I, uh, back in 2017. Um, so it's a, just this clear statement that the government of Canada recognizes that every individual in Canada has a right to a healthy environment as provided under this act. This is the preamble of the act. So in terms of a legal um, effect, it's, you know, it's effect is limited other than providing interpretive value. Um, but I've given it a gold star here because it is the first time in, if passed, this would be, SIPA would become the first federal law that recognizes the right to a healthy environment. Um, and we do see this as valuable and significant in terms of um, crystallizing a new paradigm for environmental protection. Um, but certainly it can't uh, stand on its own and a statement in the preamble needs to be backed by measures in the enforceable sections of the act. The second uh, piece is a new duty in section two of SEPA. So this section um, lists uh, several duties of the minister in the administration of the act. 
Um, so this starts to become a little bit more, more enforceable, has a bit more teeth, and we see this new duty to protect the right of every individual in Canada to a healthy environment as provided under this act. So it would be a gold star, but you keep reading and it includes this other um, clause. Um, so the, um, yeah, the right of every individual in Canada to a healthy environment, which right may be balanced with relevant factors, including social, economic, and scientific factors. Um, it's not exactly clear how, you know, what this really means, um, especially like we're particularly scratching our heads about what balancing the right to a healthy environment with social factors or scientific factors, what the implications of that are. Um, but of course, balancing environmental protection with economic factors is, um, is certainly not the direction, you know, not how we would want environmental rights to be, raises some concerns, let me just say. And it's also an unusual formulation if we look at how environmental rights have been set out in a, other legislation at the provincial level and also um, internationally. You know, at the same time, as a practical matter, it is the case that human rights, um, you know, there are, are always does involve some balancing of different factors. So um, this is an obvious place where we would like the uh, act to be the, the bill to be cleaned up through an amendment to strike this problematic clause. But again, it's uh, real implications are not really entirely clear. Um, a third and really important aspect of the new act of the new bill <clears throat> is a requirement for the ministers of environment and health to develop an implementation framework, a framework for implementing the right to a healthy environment. Um, and this, the bill actually does contain some specificity about what this new framework needs to contain. So it needs, we're really pleased that there's a specific requirement for the framework to address how principles of environmental justice and non-regression would be uh, need to be considered in the administration of SEPA. <clears throat> We're also pleased that the that the, the Bill C-28 um, sets out that the implementation framework needs to address research studies and monitoring that will be needed to fully implement the right to a healthy environment. Um, and then it's through the implementation framework that we'll find out more about what this balancing act will really entail. Um, and there, I mean, again, like we would prefer there to not be, in fact, it'll be a priority um, amendment that we will suggest is to remove this uh, balancing clause. But um, at the same time, um, there will be an opportunity to, to try to contain it through the development of this framework if it's not removed from legislation. Um, and, and the final thing I'm highlighting here is that the bill requires the ministers to complete development of this implementation framework within two years after the act passes with consultation. And the reason I put a, a kind of ambiguous <laughs> sign there is that two years seems too long. Um, on the other hand, at least there is a timeline, so it's not work that can drag on forever. So again, this is the first uh, foray of the federal federal legislation into the environmental rights, um, and it will be important for the for uh, the for the ministers and the Environment Canada and Health Canada to have this clear legislative mandate to develop policy around implementation. Um, however, the downside is that as a policy document, it will live outside the legislation and so won't be um, subject to parliamentary, uh, yeah, you know, won't be subject to the, um, can't be amended by parliament, I guess, and can be amended at the whim of um, future ministers. And finally, um, a key aspect that uh, the David Suzuki Foundation and others have, uh, other advocates for environmental rights have always put forward is um, protection of vulnerable populations. When we look at who's, when we look at, speak about protecting the right to a healthy environment, it's often those who are most vulnerable who, um, whose right is infringed. 
Um, so uh, it's important to, I, I wanted to include here in this presentation also the new pr uh, provisions in Bill C-28 that first of all define a vulnerable population and a new requirement to identify and assess risks to vulnerable populations um, when making decisions about toxic chemicals. And I know um, Anne, the next speaker, will uh, go into this in more detail, so I won't, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, the, uh, this is an important, I'll just, I gave it a gold star because in fact, um, this there's nothing currently stopping in, um, toxic assessments from considering risks to vulnerable populations as the act is currently set out. But uh, sadly and frustratingly, it's not usually done. Um, and so a legislative requirement to do so um, when the information is available is an important step forward, if not um, uh, the one that uh, could be improved. So quickly, um, I've spoken already to some of the recommendations that we are bringing forward in terms of strengthening the environmental rights provisions within SEPA, and uh, you might hear uh, more on this from other speakers as well. Um, removing that balancing like qualifying language about balancing. Um, and then also I mentioned the principles of environmental justice and non-regression being that they are highlighted as requirements for inclusion in this new implementation framework. We're also recommending that they be strengthened by integrating those principles themselves into the duties section of the act. Um, and in addition to the framework, which will live as a policy implementation framework that will live as a policy document, we would like to see um, an explicit rec legislated requirement in the act uh, to protect individuals' rights to a healthy environment when making determinations about toxic substances. And finally, to accelerate the timeline for developing an implementation framework um, and provide procedures for enforcement of that framework. I think I'm out of time here, but um, I did just want to quickly mention that Bill C-230 is a separate piece of legislation moving through Parliament right now. Um, it is, uh, it's, its title kind of tells the story. It's an act respecting the development of a national strategy to assess, prevent, and address environmental racism and to advance environmental justice. And the reason I mention it here is that this is a private member's bill, which often pays an uphill battle in being in, uh, in parliament. But this one has, is being supported by the government um, and three of the four opposition parties and actually survived its first vote in committee. Um, last month. And the government has linked its support to this bill to the environmental justice, environmental rights provisions put forward in Bill C-28. Um, so I guess I'm um, cautiously optimistic that we're starting to see um, a paradigm shift and that the measures in Bill C-28 are uh, hopefully just a beginning of more to come in the area of environmental justice and environmental rights. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lisa. All right, next up, we are going to hear from Anne Rashawn Ford. So Anne, if you would like to go ahead and share your slide deck. Great. And go ahead. Great. Thank you, Lisa, and thanks to um, Sila and Nature Canada for, for organizing this. Um, I am, as I think April said earlier, with the Nail Salon Workers Project, which is housed at the Parkdale Queen West Community Health Centre in Toronto. And I acknowledge that we are on traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chip Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples, and Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Um, I want to start with a couple of caveats. Um, the first is the use of the term vulnerable populations, which uh, Lisa touched on a little bit. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the, the, the definitions um, and you know all that it entails. But one thing I do want to say, having spoken, you know, under this umbrella of vulnerable populations on other occasions, is that I know that the term is problematic. Um, that it denotes a kind of victimization of those who fall under that category. 
uh, that there's a, a notions of helplessness or but can also extend more um, um, problematically to blame that they're victims because they've made themselves victims. When I'm sure everyone on the call would agree that the focus should be on the conditions that make them vulnerable, most of which are structural. Um, however, vulnerable populations is the language used by our federal government and it is the language that is being used in SEPA. So um, I will continue to use that somewhat regrettably. The second caveat I have is that, um, as I said, I'm not going to be touching on the full gamut of um, definitions of vulnerable populations or what is and isn't included in the act. I do wanna draw attention to um, the fact that one very key group uh, of uh, vulnerable people, if we wanna use that terminology, um, are not uh, precisely named in uh, uh, C-28 and are not named in SEPA. And this has been despite um, years, decades of, uh, of arguing for this, and that is uh, the workplace environment. Um, we don't you know, know if when reference is made to, uh, for example, here in this definition from C-28, um, it will define as those in a manner that captures biological susceptibility and potential exposure. Does that explicitly include people in the workplace? And the reason I argue that we need to focus on this and we need to pay attention to this is because, as Lisa said, we need to look at those who are, who are most heavily impacted by this uh, important legislation, those who um, are possibly the least protected uh, to see how it holds up, to see how this law holds up. And so for that reason, um, I am focusing just on workers with a highlight of, uh, on two particular groups. Um, so as Lisa said, the preamble of the act will recognize that every individual in Canada has a right to a healthy environment as provided under SEPA. Um, and also with trends in data suggesting the doubling of global chemical of the global chemicals market between 2017 and 2030, that's a scary thought, the risk for vulnerable populations will only continue to rise without more protections. So again, just pointing the arrow more at why we need to ensure that there is explicit naming of those who are most at risk. Um, what overall does the notion of a uh, right to a healthy environment mean in the context of people who have little or no control over the conditions of their work environment? So I'm going to just zone in very quickly into one group that um, definitely falls under this category that would be considered a vulnerable population. Uh, it's the rapidly growing sector of nail salon workers, and we're particularly interested in the work that I do with the discount nail salon sector, where there are far fewer um, controls and um, higher rates of um, toxic exposures. Um, a high percentage of those who work in the sector are uh, new immigrants, foreign students. It's a highly racialized community. Um, there are language barriers. Uh, and uh, as I've learned very recently, <laughs> clearly, the, the lack of health and safety materials in the languages of the people who work in this sector is pretty astonishing in how little there is. Uh, French and English, no problem, but um, get it into the key languages of, for example, the, uh, the key groups in Toronto, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Korean, very, very little, almost nothing. Um, there are more violations of employment standards uh, in this sector, and people are large, largely trained on the job, so a lot goes on behind the scenes. You do not have to be uh, licensed to work in a, um, a nail salon, in a discount nail salon. Um, City-based inspections are intended to protect, protect the customer, which is great, but they do not protect the worker. So we look to legislation such as this uh, to SEPA just to, to see if, you know, is it doing what it needs to in protecting this highly vulnerable group? And just to cite the context in which they're working, 
Um, one Greater Toronto Area nail technician in a focus group said, customers don't care about the health, the health impacts of the products they're using. They simply want nice nails at a good price. So just to give you an overview and apologies to those of you who know this area already how, and are probably tired of looking at lists like this. Um, my point being in listing, these are some of the main chemicals that are pretty much stock and trade in just about any discount nail salon that you would walk into in the various products that they use, uh, the polishes, the removers, the gels, that kind of thing, Could include all of these products. Those of you who are familiar with the chemicals management plan will recognize a lot of those those names as ones that have, have been through their assessment process. My main point I wanna make in, in, in putting this list up is that there are multiple chemical exposures as opposed to uh, one or two. So that in any given time of any day when they are working, they are being exposed to multiple um, problematic chemicals and the cumulative effects are, are ubiquitous. Um, the other point I wanna make is that the current thresholds for safe exposure don't tell the full story. Um, some research that's been done here in Toronto and there has been other research that has been duplicated in, in other jurisdictions has tried to do measuring in nail salons and, and the numbers that they come up with, um, you know, in, ter in terms of them being measured against the thresholds that have been determined to be safe, um, are in themselves problematic. We, we, the, the threshold measures need to be reevaluated, when, especially when we're looking at places like this, uh, workplaces like this where there's multiple exposures. So this is a particularly vulnerable group um, uh, for a few reasons. Um, the products that they use, uh, the, the federal government does not require that the products sold uh, for use in these settings, include ingredients on product labels. Now, this is proposed to change in C28. I think we need to hold the government to that. It's extremely important when it comes to um, not just nail salon products, but uh, personal care products generally. Um, the chemicals management plan assess assesses chemicals one at a time, not as mixtures, and nail salons, as I said, have multiple exposures daily. So there's no strong or clear language to address this in worker populations. We'd like to see uh, more that is more direct in that regard. Because of the small size of most salons, employers are not required to pay into workplace safety and, and to the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, and therefore the workers are less protected. Um, it's a universally non unionized uh, sector in Canada. That's not true uh, elsewhere. And so, because of that, there can be, there are no assumptions of proper training regarding protection. Uh, local public health units try to do what they can, the Ministry of Labor, um, but it's very hit and miss. Uh, it's also a sector that is not, that there is not good data on. We don't, we don't have exact numbers for how many nail salons there are in the city. There are several thousand. We don't know how many there will be after, uh, as they're now reopening uh, post-COVID, post-lockdown, post let's not say post-COVID. Um, the other issue that's uh, distinctive about this sector and about others that have high chemical exposures in the workplace is that there are three levels of government that intersect um, in terms of overall regulation of them. So we have the municipal level, the provincial level, and the federal level all handling different aspects of how these places should be run. Um, trying to explain that to the people who work in them and who are just trying to keep their doors open uh, is, is very challenging. Um, since COVID-19, uh, of course, their vulnerability has in fact increased. Um, they now, in addition to all of the to toxic products that they use uh, with their stock and trade uh, work, they're having to do more cleaning and disinfecting. Um, and some of the products being used are, are very problematic and increasing to their health um, problems. There is also, because this is a, lar a group largely made of um, uh, uh, an Asian population, the, the workforce within the nail salon industry in, in this part of the country, um, uh, higher, higher incidents of uh, anti-Asian racism have been documented. These are just a couple of resources that our group has produced. And I'm sorry to interrupt, to... but we're at 10 minutes. So if you could wrap up in the next minute, that'd be great. Sure. Um, Thanks. The other one I just wanted to mention that is has shares some commonalities with the nail salon sector is uh, those who work in the plastic sector of the auto industry. 
Um, I won't go into this in detail, but once again, they are, and this is large, this is a very female dominant group. I'm not talking about, for example, people who would work at Ford or GM, but people who work in the small sort of mom and pop shops that around our province that um, uh, contribute to the auto industry. This is just another list of the kinds of chemicals they're exposed to um, daily. Again, multiple exposures, cumulative effects are ubiquitous. Um, these aren't the only groups that uh, have this level of precarity in their work. Building cleaners, those who work in food canning um, facilities, IT manufacturing, hairdressers, auto body shop workers, dry cleaners, all have that, that have common problems. I've, I've added customs officers at toll bridges because they too are exposed to a high level of chemicals uh, uh, resulting from idling trucks. Um, and face health problems that many of this community face as well. Um, so Lisa raised the question of whether putting something in the preamble um, is sufficient, um, noting that it doesn't, that the, the legal effect is limited. And I would underscore this for uh, both vulnerable populations and reference to cumulative effects. Um, and in the proposed amendment, that uh, the ministers must consider available information regarding vulnerable populations and cumulative effects. Um, it's worth noting that available information for many vulnerable workers, not just in these two industries I've mentioned, but in many is very limited, it's very spotty. And the, the industry, the manufacturers, there's no requirement for those industries to produce information about cumulative effects. So my final point would be that we need to uphold the legislators involved in um, the production of, of the next stages of SEPA to hold them to these commitments and to go beyond them to require more. Um, sorry, I'm not giving out any gold stars like Lisa did, but um, uh, that's where it is. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Anne. Sorry that I was having to cut you short a little bit there. I just, we have so many questions happening in the chat. I know we're no gonna problem. have lots in the discussion period. Um, Anaria, if you would like to go ahead and put Joe's deck up, I will next introduce Joseph Castrilli, uh, counsel with the Canadian Environmental Law Association, who is going to present next. Uh, thank you, April. Um, slide two of the uh, slide deck deals uh, or attempts to uh, put into context, um, uh, or domestic context, the international um, uh, situation, which um, uh, this quote actually is uh, from this, is this part of the same one that Anne referred to in her presentation. The rest of the um, quote itself goes on to talk about uh, not only the doubling of the uh, chemicals, uh, global chemicals market, within a 13 year period and the uh, releases, exposures and concentrations that would be expected. Uh, but also, uh, unless we address that problem, uh, the sound management of chemicals was not expected to be achieved. And in fact, the United Nations uh, originally had a two decade plan to uh, uh, have the sound management of chemicals achieved by 2020. I don't think anybody believes that um, it achieved that goal last year. Uh, that same report also talks about the burden of disease from chemicals being very high. And, um, and as Anne gave you a, an overview of, um, the um, uh, risk is particularly acute for uh, vulnerable populations. And the report also went out of its way to say, uh, quote unquote, business as usual is not an option. So slide three um, essentially asks the question, um, is Bill C-28 business as usual or is it leading edge? Um, most folks have been waiting a couple of decades since the last uh, time SEPA was amended. And indeed, uh, as I think uh, Lisa mentioned, it's been at least five years since the standing committee held hearings on, on SEPA and uh, whether it should be reformed and if so, how. So the question is, does Bill C-28 deliver on the unmet expectations of folks that have been accumulating over the last uh, 20 or so years? Slide four gives um, uh, an overview of some of the um, unmet needs that were identified by the uh, national environmental community. Uh, and this is um, 
a short list, not a full list of the types of concerns that were raised by that community uh, during the course of the uh, hearings before the Standing Committee in 2016 and 2017. Slide five uh, essentially uh, provides an overview of what a Bill C-28 emphasizes uh, in comparison to the unmet needs that were identified by the national and environmental community. Uh, you'll see that um, there is some overlap, um, but there's also some dissonance. And I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the dissonance and some of the overlap to the extent I can in, in the period uh, of time I have. Um, I'm gonna begin with uh, in slide six to um, uh, address what I regard as a, um, an important uh, underpinning um, to um, uh, understanding the amendments and um, uh, from a constitutional law perspective. The, uh, in 1997, the Supreme Court of Canada upheld SEPA as valid um, federal law for the control of toxic substances on the basis of the criminal law power. Uh, that was in a decision um, uh, coming out of Quebec, uh, ultimately decided by the Supreme Court called Hydro-Quebec. And uh, what the, uh, the court was focusing on in its uh, determination that the act was valid uh, under the criminal law power was the fact that the act did not purport to control the universe of substances that were uh, in commerce in Canada in, in the late um, 1990s. At that time, about 21,000 substances, now more than 23,000. Um, and the concern the court was trying to focus on um, was um, uh, what was the extent to which the um, act could impinge unduly on provincial constitutional powers such as uh, property and civil rights. Um, and what the act uh, and what the, the court decided uh, was an important factor to consider was that the statute may have examined thousands and, uh, or required the examination of thousands and thousands of chemicals. At the end of the day, it was only purporting to address uh, bad actor chemicals that met the test for toxicity under section, what is now section 64 of the act. And so um, in 1997, there were only uh, nine substances in what is known as the list of toxic substances, schedule one. And now in 2021, there are approximately 150. Slide um, seven um, addresses or sets out um, the uh, definition of um, uh, or, or the uh, the full extent of the definition of what constitutes a SEPA, SEPA toxic substance, um, and basically it has three components. Um, and just broadly speaking, does it harm the environment? Does it harm the environment on which life depends, or is it a threat to uh, to human life or health? And um, what the um, uh, court focused on in coming to a conclusion that the criminal law power was a valid basis for upholding this statute was that. You need three elements. Um, you have to have a valid criminal law purpose that's directed at an evil or an injurious effect upon the public. And in the court's view, um, the Schedule One toxic substances are the evil, which if used um, contrary to the regulations, uh, SEPA is authorized to prohibit and penalize. So um, that's the foundation upon which uh, the Hydro-Quebec uh, court determined that SEPA was constitutional in its approach to dealing with toxic substances. And in, um, as slide eight um, demonstrates, the uh, Supreme Court has relied on the Hydro-Quebec decision a number of times to underscore the need for federal law to, um, uh, or for any federal law that relies on the criminal law power to have a valid criminal law purpose. That is to say, it must address an evil if it wants to uh, be constitutionally valid. And there have been at least two decisions since uh, 1997 from the Supreme Court, um, which in, uh, address again, Hydro-Quebec and the fact that it's um, authority for the proposition that toxic substance threats to, um, uh, of harm to the environment or health are evils that parliament can target using the criminal law power. So uh, out of that slide nine um, provides me and, and perhaps you as well, with um, the first lesson I take from uh, the constitutional litigation that's occurred over the years uh, in this area. And, and what I take from those cases is that any material deviation from uh, 
uh, a toxic substance focus of the statute could create problems for the act's constitutionality going forward. And having said that, um, I want to turn then to slide 10, which addresses uh, in, a sh in short form uh, what Bill C-28 purports to do. And in my view, it essentially sends a mixed or confusing or uncertain message to the public, the regulatory community, and the courts on the toxic substance issue by doing the following things. Firstly, it removes the phrase uh, list of toxic substances from Schedule 1. The schedule will no longer be referred to as a list of toxic substances. And secondly, um, it divides what is currently a single schedule of 150 substances into two parts. Uh, the first part will now consist of simply 19 substances, and those are essentially substances that the uh, government believes um, represent the highest uh, uh, toxic substance risks. Um, and in that group, uh, they can be made subject to prohibition and they can also um, uh, be, uh, be made subject to a, a process of substitution or examination of, of alternatives. The, uh, the bill also goes on, however, to create a part two. And in, in that part, it slots the, under, uh, the other 130 substances that are currently part of schedule one. And these 130 substances are only subject to pollution prevention measures under SEPA. And uh, substitution is uh, not an option that's capable of being considered in relation to um, those 130 substances. And for those of you who are familiar with how uh, the pollution prevention regime has worked, that's a different part of, of the statute um, that for the most part hasn't really been subject to amendments in C-28. Uh, pollution prevention as, a, as it's been applied in Canada effectively is simply a, 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 for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, it's simply a form of pollution abatement. So it's a long way from dealing with issues of use and generation and creation of toxic substances that uh, the folks who originally invented the concept of pollution prevention or um, uh, had in mind. And we see this, I think, um, uh, further um, in slide 11, or at least the implications of, um, of this in slide 11. In terms of the praise that Bill C-28 has received from industry up to now, uh, this is the, the uh, first bullet is a quote from a um, member of, um, uh, uh, sorry, it was, it was in the context of a, um, uh, the hearing on plastics that was uh, held by the Standing Committee on the Environment in April of this year. And during the course of that, of that hearing, uh, the uh, representative, which was, this was from uh, Dow Chemical, uh, made the quote that you see there. We are happy to see that the minister has proposed changes to SEPA that move away from the inappropriate toxic substance label, unquote. Um, in my view, this praise is misplaced and belies the fact that all 150 substances that in Schedule 1 are there because they met the, uh, the stringent test for being designated toxic under Section 64. And more than a few of them merit being virtually eliminated uh, from commerce. But the only thing that's been eliminated in C-28 um, is, in fact, the provisions that authorize virtual elimination of toxic substances. And we see this uh, in slide 12, or see this further in slide 12, in terms of uh, what this effectively means is that uh, by removing the phrase toxic substance from Schedule 1, it gives, number one, credence to the industry view that labeling substances toxic is inappropriate. And secondly, it creates the kind of legal uncertainty that has the potential to undermine the constitutionality of the statute. Maybe that's why the industry praises the provision, so I'm not sure. But the bottom line is that as far as um, uh, SEPA uh, being based on the criminal law power is concerned, um, we have to remember that um, at the end of the day, uh, Hydro-Quebec allowed the Axe approach to studying thousands of chemicals uh, to be an appropriate one, um, as long as only an evil few were to be dealt with uh, in terms of uh, control and regulation. Uh, and the court said that did not uh, upset the balance of Canadian federalism and authorize the constitutionality of the statute. If we're, in fact, uh, if we go to uh, slide 13, uh, 
Joe, um, yep. sorry to interrupt, but we're just past 10 minutes. So if you could wrap up in the next minute, please. I'm I'm a slide away from being Perfect. done. Perfect, great. Um, uh, effectively, uh, what C-28 does is the potential to undermine that criminal law foundation, which was recognized by Hydra Quebec. And in my view, that's simply too high a price to pay, constitutionally speaking, to make the chemical industry feel good about its products. Um, and, and finally, um, sl uh, slide 14. Um, is my take on what actually should have taken place uh, with respect to the toxics issue to the extent the, um, the feds were going to address it. Uh, number one, um, for goodness sake, restore the title of the schedule to list of toxic substances so that you reduce the potential for unwanted confusion that could end up being an issue uh, in future court case. Number two, don't create two parts. Any substance um, in schedule one should be eligible for the full risk management measures that are available under the statute, whether it's bans or substitution or whatever. And um, further, uh, I think really you need to retain the uh, virtual elimination provision. Uh, there are parts of it that can be dropped, such as the uh, unnecessary um, level of quantification for release provision, which has been, I think, instrumental in why the government has not used the section very much in the last 20 years. The goal should be as it always um, uh, was expected to be, but hasn't been under this statute. The goal should be sunsetting of these chemicals and uh, achieving zero discharge, not fiddling, fiddling around with a level of quantification that nobody can use uh, for the purposes of regulation. And finally, the other problem with the virtual, virtual elimination provision, which was not dealt with by uh, the government is that inorganic substances such as lead and mercury ought to be eligible for virtual elimination to the extent they're manipulated by humans and, and the material ends up in commerce. Uh, I'm not going to speak to the remainder of my slides. They address uh, the issue of a uh, right to a healthy environment and my views on that. Um, but you have or will have uh, the entire slide deck um, at some point and hopefully it'll answer your questions with respect to that as well. Um, thank you, April, and uh, other members of the panel. Thanks very much, Joe. All right, at this time, we are going to move on to our last speaker. So, Hugh, if you want to go ahead and share your slide deck when you're ready, you can get going. I'll just remind everyone while you're screen sharing um, really quickly, Hugh, that we are recording all of the presentations. So we'll be making that available. I know we're having a few technical glitches in the background. Um, we had a huge jump in registration right uh, earlier today, kind of late yesterday, which is great, but I know a few people are getting turned away as a result. So our apologies if anyone's having that challenge and the whole session's being, the whole presentation portion is being recorded. So we will make that available afterwards. All right, go ahead, Hugh. Thanks, April, and I'll just uh, set my timer and hope that helps keep me honest. Um, thanks to uh, everyone for coming, distinguished uh, participants and distinguished co-panelists. Um, I'm working, uh, thanks to Mark Butler, who's here with us uh, from Nature Canada, on part six of uh, CEPA, which deals with uh, biotechnology. and um, Many of you were with us for a webinar in January, I think. And I'm going to very quickly review what we said there and then update uh, us to what's happened since related to part six um, in Bill C-28 and relatedly. So very briefly, what uh, we talked about in January was that currently, and the reason I should say that, that Mark and Nature Canada contacted me was because of an experience that uh, Mark had with um, uh, the introduction by a United States based company called Aqua Bounty who applied to Canada to manufacture salmon eggs of a genetically modified using a gene editing technology uh, salmon using uh, two species uh, genetic parts and so to make that long story short, um, the time that was taken for the assessments under SEPA was too short uh, to, in particular, to allow, and indeed the act doesn't allow public involvement in that assessment. Um, and that's what that slide says. So I can quickly speed through. Um, 
and I spoke in January uh, about what I call some hard truths about SEPA. Um, first is that we have an exposure-based and a risk-based notion of harm. Um, so that sometimes allows uh, the hazards posed um, by, a, by a substance, and substance includes organisms uh, such as the aqua bounty fish, um, the hazards that those pose, that those pose. And um, the second hard truth I talked about was that there's little or no opportunity uh, for the public to participate and discuss whether a new chemical or a new living organism is needed in our society. And third, uh, SEPA really, uh, because of various mechanisms and particularly the confidentiality position, uh, uh, provisions, protects the market and much less uh, does it protect nature. Uh, so we made a series of recommendations to strengthen part six and I outlo outlined those at our previous webinar. Um, and we'll come back to the key ones um, and you can review these um, when the presentation is posted. Um, so what we said in summary was that strengthening part six of SEPA would require that um, that we really meaningfully address the risks that new living organisms, uh, which is a phrase used in part six of SEPA, pose to nature. And in particular, uh, Nature Canada has introduced the notion of a wild counterpart. So in the case of this genetically modified uh, salmon, it posed a threat and indeed poses a threat to natural uh, or wild Atlantic salmon should one of these, um, should several uh, things go wrong with, with, with uh, the aqua bounty salmon, which we think is something that's inevitable eventually. Um, and strengthening part six also requires addressing indigenous rights and the concerns that the public will have about various proposals to introduce new living organisms into the environment. Um, so in addition to the points that Lisa, Anne and Joe made uh, about what's in Bill C-28, uh, I've taken a couple of headlines from um, the government's summary that it released uh, along with the bill back in April. Um, so they will require or propose to require in the bill uh, that proponents provide new information under uh, when, they, when they in effect apply to introduce new substances and living organisms. Uh, and those manufacturing a, a, a substance will have to um, uh, provide, will provide information to anyone that they pass care and control of that substance onto. These are undoubtedly good measures, but pretty modest. And uh, I won't speak of the amendment to the Food and Drugs Act, except to say that it further makes SEPA residual to other acts. It may one day apply to new living organisms, but for the moment, the government's proposing just uh, changes in relation to the drugs part of the Foods and Drugs Act. Um, among the confidential business information uh, provisions already in SEPA, uh, Bill C-28 proposes what I call just mere tinkering. And I'll just look at the first bullet. Um, uh, confidentiality requests must, if the bill, if and when the bill passes, be accompanied by uh, reasons. And that's something that's laudable, but should have happened years ago. Um, I won't read the other ones. Other measures included labeling, which are something that is something that would happen down the road. And in parallel to Bill C-28, uh, the government has proposed to, to update the regulatory framework for uh, products of biotechnology, um, that the relevant regulations are the new substances notification regulations for organisms. And if I have to refer to that later, I'll say NSNRO because it's a very long name. Um, that regulatory review, as I say, is something the government's proposing in parallel to the act. And we think that amendments need to be made to the act uh, through Bill C-28 or frankly, through a much improved Bill C-28. Um, so we proposed amendments to align SEPA reform with indigenous rights. And um, I would note that um, Bill C-15, the UNDRIP um, law has come into force since uh, Bill C-28 and that requires um, 
that requires uh, the government to take all measures necessary to ensure that its laws, including SEPA, are consistent with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And we proposed amendments to reverse the burden of proof so that the proponent of substances, including new li living organisms, must show that their uh, new living organism is not toxic. And they also should show that there's a demonstrable need in society uh, for the product that they're proposing to manufacture, use, or import in Canada. We've also proposed amendments that would require the SEPA ministers to give public notice of an assessment uh, and give public notice of a waiver request, um, a request by the proponent not to provide the information that would otherwise be required. Uh, the public now doesn't find out, as the aqua bounty example illustrates, until really decisions have been made, the assessments being conducted, and they're left out. We are left out of the, that pro, those processes. And finally, amendments that would require opportunities for the public to participate in, um, in scientific assessments. We've also recommended further amendments uh, to, uh, that would emphasize the public right to participate in assessments and decision-making. And that those particularly would address uh, what I mentioned earlier, the, the uh, primacy of confidentiality that uh, industry proponents uh, claim and indeed have won in SEPA and uh, ever since SEPA was enacted. Um, those are uh, all of my slides. And so it, it was very quick and I can expand on some parts, but I look forward to, in any case to the questions where we can perhaps dig into these issues um, a bit more deeply. Thank you so much, Hugh. Appreciate that. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to ask all of our presenters, all of our speakers to turn their cameras back on. Uh, Hugh, if you can pull your slide deck down, great. Uh, we'll get our presenters to turn their cameras on and, uh, and unmute themselves if they'd like so that we can see each other. Um, so we are just after two o'clock. We have about 10 minutes left uh, for a few questions. I hope that everyone has been following along in the chat box. There's been really rich discussion in there, lots of questions. Um, I know that we're not going to have time to get to all of them, which is just an indication of how important and complex this topic is. Um, before I dive into the Q&A, um, I am just going to take a moment to pause and thank our presenters um, very, very much. We are going to stop the recording before we move into the Q&A, so I want to make sure that we're on the record as thanking our presenters and everyone for participating. So you'll just bear with me for a moment while I pause our recording. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> 